Hey, Gene Schumacher and De Dr. Deborah Shapiro, welcome to Plant Yourself. Thank you, Howard. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, you know, we, we had a chat uh, a couple days ago and I'm really excited to share what you guys uh, are up to with my audience. So why, why don't we start with what you guys are up to? Well, Gene and I hooked up to develop a program called the Pregnancy Advantage. And we're very, very excited about this. I have a background as an obstetrician gynecologist, and I have been in, I have been in private practice for 27 years. And uh, Jean is an educator, also a PhD, and a teacher, chemistry teacher. So the, the program that we developed is very special because it's actually helping women prepare for pregnancy. Because now we know so much about the effects of uh, sort of the, the fetal milieu, what, what the environment is around the developing embryo even and fetus, um, and has, that has such a huge effect on the future health of the child, not only the child, but even that child's child, the grandchildren of the, of the patient. So while it's not possibly the best time to be pregnant during a pandemic, it is definitely the right time to prepare for a pregnancy. Mm. And that's what the pregnancy advantage is all about. Gotcha. So like what I think about when I hear that is like prevention is really a hard sell for people, mm. right? Like, like we in this whole field of lifestyle medicine, plant-based nutrition, we're like, hey, eat right now and you don't have to get Alzheimer's, you don't have to get heart disease, diabetes, all this stuff. And people, it's really hard to think about you know, suffering now, for lack of a better word, the, the, for some future benefit. But it seems like pregnancy is one of those times where like all these preparation, prevention, thinking ahead hormones, like just kick in. I remember with our, you know, my wife's first pregnancy, all of a sudden, she started like taking crowbars to walls like we got to make like you know months early like the nesting instinct is, the, is there something about pregnancy that kind of uh, predisposes women to think about preparation prevention getting ready well i think so absolutely i don't think women make such huge changes especially around diet once they are pregnant but they are definitely thinking about it before for example when else is a woman really going to stop drinking alcohol Right. I mean, the only time I think someone who does drink occasionally or drinks a lot is she is going to stop when she is pregnant because she knows that that is a teratogen and that's been sort of drummed into her cigarettes. Also, I only had one patient in my 27 years who continued to smoke through a pregnancy, but most women are also willing to give that up for the baby. So I agree with you completely. And Jean, you actually you had a child, right? Or two. So you must know. How, do you have a feeling about that as well? Well, I think. I wish I had had, you know, just going back to my pregnancies, I wish I had had someone like this to guide us through because I didn't know anything. I mean, I, you know, had the basic biology and stuff like that in, in high school and, and whatnot. But, you know, I, I didn't know about the toxins. And I now know that I did some damage to my children because of, you know, and I was doing what I thought was right you know, giving them milk and dairy and feeding them like my parents were raised, how I, you know, I fed my kids the way I was raised. So I thought I was doing the right thing. So clearly I wasn't. <laughs> and it was really tough, you know, now knowing what I know that knowing that I did a lot of damage, like my son was on the nebulizer for a long time. And I know a lot of it had to do with the, the dairy. So <sighs> It just it just makes me, you know, sad that I have not been able to connect. So, you know, in that sense, with what I did, you know, I now know what I did was not good. And so that's one of the reasons why I think I'm so profound about and passionate about this is because I know the toxins and the environmental toxins that we've been dealing with are huge. So that's one of the reasons why I want to help kind of <laughs> like penance, you know, to help other women so that they can understand that they need to get their bodies cleaned out and, and toxic free. So I think one of the things that 
is amazing that I've learned from Deborah is that when you conceive the level of toxins that are in your body are kind of like frozen for the baby and that the baby is exposed to those toxins. And so that's what they live in for nine months until they can actually come out of the chute and start, to, you know, to, for a lack of <laughs> delicate say, but passing stools, you know, until they're actually pooping, then they can get rid of some of the toxins that are in their body. But that's what they're developing in. And so, and I've seen it in the classroom. You know, I just stepped out after 35 years of teaching in the classroom and I see so many health issues in our children when they should be at the most vibrant time of their life in their, the best health that they should be in in their life, they're not. Mm. You know, and I see chronic issues. Kids already type two diabetics, um, I, ADD, ADHD, and so many other things. I mean, migraines, depression, and they can't think. They have a hard time transferring knowledge or information about things that they've learned to extrapolate that information to new concepts mm. or ideas. They have a tough time. Yeah. So th this this conversation feels like it could be a real double edged sword because there is, you know, in, in our culture, in our zeitgeist, there is the feeling that the mother is never good enough. Right. She's never done the, well enough. She's never present enough, never has enough energy. And so like part of what I'm worried about about this conversation, Dr. Deborah, is that you're going to tell us all these things. And like Gene, people are going to go, oh, my God, like I didn't realize that's why my kid's on an inhaler. That's why my kid has type one diabetes. That's why my kid has behavioral problems. Um, and you know, so at the same time as we can start to empower people to understand and take charge, there is this this danger that uh, that women are going to hear this and just feel even worse, right? Mm, well, that's very interesting, Howard, that you that you mentioned that because I'm actually seeing the beauty of the other side of this. That this is a way to not only create healthier pregnancies, healthier moms, healthier children, healthier grandchildren, healthier future generations, but and very topically, this is a way to reduce greenhouse gases and your, your carbon footprint and gr raise your child in a way that might actually help with global warming in the future um, and may maybe allow us to reach that Paris Accord agreement where we don't raise our temperature more than two degrees centigrade. And in addition, in addition, even more topically, you're going to be reducing the risk of the kind of diseases that cause us to be more susceptible to COVID-19. And, and even then, even something else is that you're going to be reducing the risk of future zoonotic diseases and pandemics. So if you can teach people to embrace plant-based eating and living without all these toxins around them, it's going to do so much good sort of on an explosive nature on so many levels that I think it, I think that that, to me, that sort of overcomes any, any sort of personal, you know, sort of guilt about what you didn't do and what you might do. I mean, we're, we spend so much time as physicians trying to help people get healthier at age 40 and 50, you know, when we recognize that there's already some prediabetes or diabetes um, or heart disease. And that's all well and good. That's all fine. But the point of this, pro of this program and really what I was thinking about is that I wanted to make I wanted to make future generations healthier from day one, from T minus nine months. Mm -hmm. and, 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 it, and really diseases start there. When I started learning about, about epigenetics and the way that we can change our, the, our gene expression um, and then our health by, uh, by attaching sort of these methyl groups and, and his, so there's something called histone modification. So it's, it's changing your DNA without actually changing the gene sequence. And the things that do that are things like um, environmental toxins, uh, PCBs and BPA and parabens and phthalates and, and things that are around us all the time. But in addition, saturated fat, and, and a high fat diet and, and maternal obesity, they all have these kinds of effects. Um, so yes, you could say it's gonna put a lot, it's gonna put a big a burden on, on moms, but I think that, the, that the, the effects could be so great for the, for the entire world that it, mm. it sort of overshadows that consideration. I think there is some personal responsibility we have to take.
Mm -hmm. But I also think it's empowering to the woman, you know, that, oh my God, okay, I didn't know about this. Now I do. And I can, can take control. And it's something that you can do on almost a personal level that you are controlling your environment, your habitat, almost like when women start nesting, like you said, you know, like your wife was like, okay, let's knock down walls and let's do this. And, you know, getting ready for the nesting instinct. I think once you start to realize that you can make it be a better place for your baby, I think that is so empowering too. But it's going to be tough. I mean, I understand there's a lot, there is a lot of inequity in terms of, of availability of good food and, uh, and also, uh, you know, the distribution of, of money in this country and who has a key of wealth and, and who can afford uh, not only the, the food, but also getting rid of the plastics and, and using other kinds of safer cookware and all of this. Um, but we're never going to change anything on a global scale, I don't think, until we can change what we eat. Because if we could eliminate um, the desire for meat and dairy, and we can really transform this whole food system, um, we would have enough food for everyone. We would have enough good food for everyone. And we would stop poisoning the environment with toxic chemicals, which are reducing the bees and the butterflies. I mean, all of these things. So, I mean, we hear about these chemicals, and but now we know not only is it destroying bees and butterflies and pollinators, but it's also causing epigenetics, epigenetic changes in us that will then go through to future generations and cause ill health. I know it is, it is very interesting. And I think that's such an interesting point that you brought up. And there's a lot of pressure on women and women do feel a lot of pressure. And I, and I, um, I am sympathetic to that. Absolutely. Um, but there's sort of no turning back now, you know, that we've, we've already been told there's no way that we're going to be able to feed the population that's expected by 2050 on, on the typical American diet, which is not going to be able to. Um, so this is the best way to do it. Do it before you get pregnant. All right. So let's, let's talk about um, kind of the, the various elements that go into this, and then maybe we can come back and talk about each one in turn. So obviously there's the food. And so we'll, we will talk about that. But you also mentioned plastics and other like what what are the what's the broad scope of things? So that for right. people who are just thinking, oh, I'll just eat broccoli and give up cheeseburgers and I'll be fine. Well, that's that's a huge step. Boy, if you could eat broccoli, mm. that would be wonderful. because <laughs> The, uh, the sulforaphane is fantastic because it induces the phase mm. two enzymes in your liver. And that is your major way of detoxifying things in your body. So eat your broccoli for sure. Mm -hmm. A plant, a whole plant, a whole, a food, sorry, ah, a diet that's centered around whole plant foods is going to be the best diet. So vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, and spices. That would be, that would form the basis of the diet. It's just your usual, it's the diet that, that Dean Ornish showed along with other healthy lifestyle changes could reverse heart disease. It's the same diet that Dr. Esselstyn uses to reverse heart disease and many other doctors now. Um, it's the diet that's used also to reverse diabetes and other diseases as well. Um, so the same diet that can reverse disease later on in life can actually help to prevent disease because if you can get moms to be a healthier weight, then they will, they will have children that are healthier as well. Mm -hmm. Is diabetes even like, you know, it, if you are, if you are obese, when you're pregnant, your child is more likely to develop diabetes and, and obesity later on. Mm. So that's one was the food. Right. Okay, great. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll put a pin in that, come back to it in detail. What, what else? So then, then there are other lifestyle, life, sort of lifestyle medicine factors. So stress reduction is extremely important because we know that stress also has a role in epigenetics and causing, causing disease in offspring when, when it's experienced by the mom and even, you know, experienced by your grandmother. So that's the kind of thing that just goes, Does, goes do you on. A, do you have a favorite example of that or study or historical? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there, there actually are quite a few. Uh, there have been studies of wartime uh, famines. But what I really like to use as an example is something called the Project Ice Storm. So there was an incredible uh, winter storm in Quebec in 1998. It was minus 20 degrees for 40 days. People lost power for a prolonged period of time. There was tremendous social upheaval and stress. And researchers decided to follow the offspring of women who were pregnant during, the during this storm. And they could actually uh, determine sort of on, on, on a scale of stress um, mild stress, uh, 
uh, and, and a lot of stress and also perceived stress, like post-traumatic stress disorder versus actual stress, like leave it, losing your power for 40 days. And what they found was that women who, who experienced more stress, whether it was perceived or actual stress, had children that had more autism spectrum disorder, more autoimmune disorder, and more metabolic disease. And women who had more actual stress, they were, were finding that hundreds of genes changed expression. Hundreds of genes, genes that code for glucocorticoids, genes that code for immunoglobulins. And they, and they were able to, to determine that these changes, these epigenetic changes persisted over time in these offspring. They've been following them for, for now you know, 19, 20 years. So, so this is extremely important. It means that the offspring of women, if, you, if your grandmother or your mother was under a lot of stress while she was pregnant with you, your immune system is not going to be functioning in the same way. Your reaction to stress is not going to be the same. So that's... So does that, that, does that explain why, you know, I grew up in a very stable suburban middle-class household with lots of privileges and you know no no real financial stress and i'm still a nervous wreck most of the time because <laughs> my my mother was a holocaust survivor yes <laughs> i think so you know it's kind of funny and i don't know if this i don't really have data about this it's sort of my own idea about you have people talk and i'm jewish i'm jewish um have people talk about neur neurotic Jews. And I would probably already also talk about neurotic Jews, but you kind of wonder about that, right? Of everything that we've gone through, because actually there are epigenetic changes that have been, that have been discovered um, as a legacy of slavery. Um, I read an amazing article by a Dr. Fatima Jackson from Howard University. She actually looked at um, the, the epigenetic changes in a number of genes that are associated with 400 years of slavery and institutionalized racism. So yes, these things, we carry the traumas of our ancestors within us, in our DNA. I, I believe so, absolutely. Mm. Okay, so we'll, I'm going to come, come back to that as well. What, what else, aside from food and stress? Section. So... With stress, you'd say sleep, uh, exercise and sleep, right? Those, those are other parts of the of, uh, lifestyle medicine. So to get adequate sleep and rest because mm -hmm. it's so important for your brain to regenerate um, and also to exercise because it's so important for fertility and for also a healthy pregnancy and reduce complications in pregnancy. But la the last portion, I think the portion that most doctors probably are not even thinking about yet is the removal of these endocrine disrupting chemicals from the mm -hmm. environment, um, around, uh, from the maternal environment. Mm -hmm. as much as possible. I mean, obviously some people live near, near freeways and there's, a, there's a, a tremendous amount of air pollution that they can't do anything about. And there may be um, gassing of things in their homes, you know, um, outgassing and, and chemicals in their home that they can't completely avoid. And, and Jean actually can speak to some of this to see what, you know, what people can do. But I think there's a lot that people can do once they learn where these chemicals are. Mm. So I had a... Uh... Uh, someone pitched me to be a guest on the podcast talking about endocrine disrupting chemicals. And I was excited until they sent me their book, which was mainly about soy. <laughs> so I, I wow. kind of dropped, I kind of dropped the topic as being a little bit fruitcake. Uh -huh. uh, well, do you want to hear, do you want to hear something interesting about endocrine disrupting chemicals? There is one. I mean, it's not, um, you know, soy, they do consider genestine some of these, they are hormones and you could think of them as, endocrine disrupting chemicals, although I think that's all soy has just positive effects in humans. Um, but here's one for you. DES, do you remember diethylstilbestrol? So that's an, that is sort of an estrogen-like, it's an estrogen, it's actually an estrogen, um, but it, definitely an endocrine disrupting chemical. It was given to women, and most, I think most women have heard of DES, it was given to women uh, between the 50s and the 70s. This was just like morning sickness, right? To prevent miscarriage. Okay. It was given to women in pregnancy to prevent miscarriage. I, I didn't, uh -huh. I misspoke. Okay. Okay. Um, so we know that it caused an unusual effect in their offspring. So DES daughters are susceptible to a certain kind of rare vaginal and cervical cancer called clear cell carcinoma. Well, that's, that's one thing. But, you, but I just learned that actually the sons of DES daughters are more likely to be born with something called hypospadias, which is a disorder where the, the urethra does not go uh, through the center of the penis. It's misplaced. 
So is that mm. interesting? So that is a way that you can see this long lasting effect of an endocrine disrupting chemical on future generations causing, a birth, causing birth defects in the mm. But I think there's also, I think there's also these endocrine disrupting chemicals that are in our personal care products that we're just not even aware of because in the United States, there is absolutely no regulation. I mean, like zero, like nothing. There's no regulation at all in, about these chemicals. And a lot of them are bioaccumulative, that they're going to stay in your, because there's basically two types of chemicals that your body's exposed to. There's fat soluble and there's water soluble. So if it's, if it's water soluble, your body still has to process it, but it's going to be going out through your urine and you're going to pee it out. If it's fat soluble, it's going to be going through you and staying in your cells. And these chemicals are, start, are going to start to accumulate. And we are literally like walking chemical experiments because we don't know what these toxins are going to be doing to us down the road and what the impact is. But things like, for example, we know like, like parabens. Parabens, oh my gosh. I mean, this is just a chemical family. I mean, there's a lot of different types. There's methylparaben, butylparaben, propylparaben. It doesn't matter. Anything with the ending paraben is going to be pretty toxic to our system in terms of an endocrine disruptor. So what happens, and here's, what, here's how it impacts our body. Our body thinks it's not, but our body thinks it's estrogen. So if you're accumulating a lot of estrogen in your system, um, that's gonna have an impact on, your, on, a, on a woman on some place on your reproductive system, whatever the, like, the weakest link is. And it's most commonly expressed as breast cancer. And so, you just go, oh my gosh. And like, you know, when I'm treating, you know, helping to, you know, coach several women that are dealing with breast cancer and they're never educated. They're just put immediately onto the medical treadmill in terms of, of chemotherapy, in terms of radiation and surgery. They're not taught, you know, they don't discuss about like, okay, you need to remove the toxins. You re need to remove like the, you know, some of the, you have to go through your house and look at the, the toxins that you're being exposed to in the personal care products. And I think that's one of the great places like the environmental working group comes in to play because they have, it's called the cosmetic database. And it's not just cosmetics, it's shampoo, deodorant, toothpaste, sunscreen, sunscreen. Oh my gosh. They just had a huge article in the Wall Street Journal about the, t the toxic chemicals that are in sunscreens. And we're just, you know, literally applying it. And it's like, oh my God, do I, do I, go out and get sunburned and get burnt to a crisp or do I put these chemicals on our body that are toxic? So they mm -hmm. have a, a sunscreen database that will can help guide you to make better choices. They actually have an mm -hmm. app called healthy living that you can download for free. I like free. This is the EWG environmental yeah. working group, EWG.org healthy, healthy living app. Okay. Healthy mm -hmm. living. And it's a free app so that you can actually literally take a screenshot of your personal care product and what's going to happen is it'll give you it's for the personal care products it rates it on a scale of one to ten and so it tells you how toxic it is on a scale of one to ten you want to start looking for ones okay mm -hmm. in your personal care products so this is a good place to start i don't agree mm -hmm. with everything that the environmental the environmental working group like for example they may label something as a overall a one but when you start looking at the chemicals that are as the ingredients inside some chemicals might be re rated a five or a six so mm -hmm. how can you have an overall score of a one when you've got products or ingredients in the the personal care mm -hmm. products that are rated very toxic mm -hmm. so i'm not right. quite sure how well, their their yeah. their system works well, let, so let, I don't let agree me, with everything, but it's a good place right. to start. Well, let, let me ask you this, because um, a lot of, in our culture, it feels like any, any kind of discussion about things that are ubiquitous being harmful feels very alarmist, right? So there's talk about cell phone radiation, and if you talk about cell phone radiation or electromagnetic sensitivity, you're immediately a nutcase, and people will throw tons of science at you showing that there's nothing to worry about. And I feel like the same thing is largely true of plastics, of cosmetics, of off-gassing, that if you just go and, and just do a regular Google search, you will find lots of science, whether it's Monsanto or 3M or the companies that are making this are basically saying, those other people are crazy, relax, live your life, there's nothing to worry about. What, what is the state of the evidence? Is it that, you know, the absence of evidence is equal to evidence of absence? Or like what leads you to believe uh, 
what's the evidence that this is a big deal? I think that there's, there's a lot of evidence. If you just look up endocrine disrupting chemicals and, um, and epigenetics, for example, because that's what I'm really interested in, um, there's a lot of evidence. They can, they can actually see the epigenetic changes in the DNA, and they've been studying these. Um, not we don't go that far back. We're really talking about, you know, 2016 and 17, but there's a lot of data about this. So I don't think it's really, um, you, know, you know, I'm not talking about cell phone radiation. I'm really only talking about these endocrine disrupting chemicals. I, I don't think there's somebody saying that endocrine disrupting chemicals don't exist or that they're not important. Um, so they do cause epigenetic changes and they are affecting the health of offspring. They cause they cause autism. They're, effect, they're associated with, with gene, many genes that are associated with autism. Autism and ADD and uh, diabetes and cancer and uh, thyroid disease and mm, uh, diminished IQ even. Uh, so uh, I, no, I, don't, I don't think this is up for interpretation by... Uh, by this real scientific, by the scientific well, community, that's not. The well, then how, then how is when you walk down the store, the um, the cosmetics or the shampoo or the, the detergent section of your supermarket, that every single product has these dangerous chemicals and nobody's talking about it? Well, why are they still? Why are we still uh, subsidizing feed grains for meat and processed meat? And why do we still have processed meat without a warning label on it? I mean, I, I think. I think that our, our government is, is not as thoroughly invested in our future health. You know, in Europe, some of these chemicals are banned. They absolutely are banned in Europe. And Europe has actually already done, um, um, they've actually looked at the, the cost of these endocrine disrupting chemicals to their, to their, you know, their gross national product and their, and, and, and their, um, their health costs. And it's, it's billions of euros. So, no, I think, other, I think other countries may be a little bit ahead of us. Um, mm. But, you know, for example, there are dyes, there are, there are food colorings that are banned in Europe and they're, and they're still here. So, yes, I would say that our government, it probably does not, you can't really rely on, um, on our government because it's a free enterprise mm -hmm. system. And so things that sell, things that people want. I mean, I could go into a grocery store and say that almost all of it is unhealthy, is not really mm -hmm. food, right? But it's still being sold. I grew up on Apple Jacks. I mean, I, you know, if you put Apple Jacks and an apple in front of a child, what will they go for? And that's just, mm -hmm. it's just, it's kind of shameful in a way. Right. So, so Gene, you're, you're, you're a science teacher, right? I am. Chemistry, so I, environmental science, biology, you name it. Okay. I've pretty much taught it. I'm, I'm having a flashback to eighth grade. Might have, you know, might have been seventh grade. Um, doing, we had to do a science project, uh, some research. And a friend of mine and I chose, we were going to look at the FDA um, and specifically hot dogs. And are like the nitrates and nitrates bad for you. And of course, I was predisposed to think, of course, anything, it's got to be bad for you. My friend, however, was uh, his, his father was actually like one of the people who had um, he'd done a lot of work in chemistry, you know, so he had a sort of different approach than I did. And he was showing me these studies that showed that, well, yes, it caused cancer, but, it, you know, you'd have to feed it to people at 40,000 times the rate that they were normally going to get it. And I was like, gee, that it seems like there was a lot of alarmism. What, what's the evidence? What are the studies that are done? Because you, you can't do a randomized control clinical trial of endocrine disruptors. Is it looking at, you know, test tube results? Is it looking at animal studies, you know, rodents? Is it um, epidemiological cohort studies? Like what's, what, what is the state of the evidence and you know, that, 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 that still allows companies plausible deniability? Well, I think partly it's, you know, going along the, following along the same path as the tobacco industry, you know, that they kept denying. I mean, I, I think we can all agree that cigarettes are not a, a good, healthy choice, but we still have people smoking. And why? Why is that still happening? Because for a long, long time, people 
you know, they were given mixed messages along the way. You know, doctors, what doctor, doctor, what cigarette do you prefer? You know, I prefer camels, you know, that kind of thing. So there's this vast marketing on that. And, you know, they've known since the 20s and the 30s about the relationship of, of tobacco. And I think it's along the same way. But their loophole for the tobacco industry is how could you prove that the cigarettes cause this when we're being exposed to so many other environmental factors? So it's really hard to just narrow down or focus, you know, that this one chemical caused this problem or that within the tobacco industry, you've got, you know, from the nicotine, that the nicotine caused lung cancer. You can't say that because what if the person was exposed to asbestos along their line? You know, there's so many other environmental factors that we, it's so difficult to isolate the impact of these toxins. So, you know, that's one of the hard parts about trying to prove these things that in terms of that, in the meantime, there are studies, you know, showing like what Deborah was saying, especially in Europe. I mean, Europe is, it has what's called the precautionary principle where you have to literally prove that your product is not toxic mm -hmm. before you can allow it to be sold in Europe. So like, like Johnson and Johnson, or, or like, I shouldn't say Johnson and Johnson, but any company that sells products here in the United States or in Europe, they will change things. So they have a, a, a product that's sold here in the United States and the same product that's sold in Europe is very differently chemically formulated. And it's interesting. It's like, why, why don't we just have one? You know, it's like you're selling toothpaste, you know, here in the United States and you're selling it over in Europe. Why is it different in Europe than it is here? Why isn't it the same product? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, it's because Europe has very different regulations. We don't have regulations here in the United States. There is absolutely none, zero, in terms of regulations of these chemicals. So I think that's one of the biggest problems that we face is trying to isolate, you know, a study that affects of this endocrine disruptor or that endocrine disruptor. You know, we just see that once you start to clean up your life and you clean up a lot of the toxins, especially in terms of the foods, then you start to see changes. So, you know, in people, in terms of a po more positive health outcomes. So, you know, I think that's one of the biggest obstacles that we face. Mm -hmm. But there have been a lot of studies using animals, obviously. I mean, these, these, these chemicals have been studied in, in, in rats and mice and even macaque monkeys and different, you know, different non-human primates <clears throat> and shown that they have this epigenetic effect. They, see, they, can, they can now really actually trace the markers, uh, the methylation and the histone modification and the, and the um, non-coding um, RNA and all of this. So this is um, not as mysterious as um as some people might think so things like bpa we know bpa um is an obesogen you sort of wonder why your dogs and cats are getting fat sometimes is because you're also feeding them these canned foods so cans that are lined in bpa this is an obesogen it's going to cause your child to become obese um so, so how, how does that how does that work because you know so i learned obesity that weight is a, is a function of calories in calories out how does uh, is that wrong or do the obesogens mediate yeah. that in some way um, no, well, yes, metabolism. Yes, absolutely. So it does. It, so this involved. So we're we're causing changes in genes that affect your metabolic rate and metabolism. So I think that's that's probably how. Um, but in addition, you also might be changing your your you know your gut your gut bacteria your microbiota is also very important for metab for metabolism um, and um, and satiety and and and. Um, uh, hormone regulation as well. So no, I think it's it's multifactorial. It, it works in many different ways. But we do know that these are that some of these chemicals are considered obesogens. Mm. And they're going to change, yeah, cause you to storm. Yeah. So what's I mean? What's scary about this is okay. You say you know go eat a whole food plant based diet. Like somebody with the means can go do that. They can. I can eat my broccoli. I can go to the farmer's market. I can get Misfits boxes. I can. I can cut out this stuff. Like it might be hard. It might be very challenging. It might, you know, cause social rifts, but I have ultimately agency over that. But when you're talking about like can you know BPA and and products and you know environmental toxins, um, it makes me kind of just want to give up. So, like I said, you know, also like there's some costs. Like I, I will admit to you that I spent about a hundred dollars 
a couple of years ago on these really nice OXO plastic containers where I can store my grains, my oatmeal, my beans. They're, they're, they're you know, square uh, bases so that, you know, that they take up, you know, minimum, minimal extra space. Is, am I, should I just throw them out? Jean, what do you think? They may be non-BPA, right? Well, I, I think part of it is, is the food being, it, is the food reacting to it? Or, you know, I, I think more along the lines, like I still use plastic, you know, like if I'm taking carrots to work, well, I stepped out of the classroom, but if I'm taking it like on a, on a day trip and mm -hmm. I put some carrots into a plastic container, those carrots are not chemically reacting with the plastics, you know, so I, I'm okay with that. So it's just mm -hmm. learning, I think, a little bit along the lines of what is the best way to do that. I mean, obviously, like glass is going to be the best, you know, source to be able to store foods in. And that's, you can't, you can't go wrong because glass doesn't react, you know, it's, it's you know, inert chemically. So mm -hmm. it's not going to react with the foods. But when you start to learn about these, the, the things like, for example, they talk about putting uh, water bottles, you know, you don't want to leave them in the car because the heat will then cause the plastics to leach out mm. so into the water. So, you know, again, so, causing issues. So, you know. So, is, and then so it, is, is, is the temperature the issue that if it's cold, cold on cold, it's usually okay. And I just shouldn't put hot foods into plastic containers or bags. Right, definitely, you know, especially hot foods, temperature is definitely gonna have an impact on it in terms of leaching out the, the chemicals, for sure. And they talk about this in terms of like the water bottles. Like I keep going back to this because that's one of the classics is we tend to leave like those water bottles in the car, you know? And I think sometimes other things, you know, people don't understand as well in the process of processing of water. Like they'll take, like, for example, there's two, uh, there's like water bottles that are just distilled water that, people are consuming and drinking. First of all, distilled water is extremely oxidizing to the system. It, it you know, if you measure it with a, a meter, it's called, um, uh, oh my God, I'm having a brain fart. <laughs> anyway, um, you can measure the me measure of how oxidizing something is versus how an antioxidant. So on this scale, almost all water products, water bottles are extremely oxidizing to the system. It, or oxidation reduction potential is what it's called. Thank you. I had, a, <laughs> had to think okay. about it there for a second. <laughs> so you can measure that. And it's one of the things that I set up a chemistry lab for my students and I had them bring in Bring in whatever you're doing, whatever water, you know, water bottles that you're using. Let's test them. And so we measured the ORP, the oxidation reduction potential. We also measured the pH. So the pH is a measurement is um, the pH system. It stands for potential for hydrogen, pi, potential for hydrogen. And so you have the water molecule, which breaks up into the H plus and then OH. So, which is great. And so you can shift in terms of how much, how much pH it is. But I need you to understand that the pH is a logarithmic scale, meaning that it's based upon powers of 10. So like if you go from a pH of seven, so the pH scale goes from zero to 14. Seven is neutral, okay? So seven to six is not a factor of one, it's a power of 10. So going from seven to five is not a factor of two or 20, it's a factor of 100. So if you're consuming something that has a pH of say 5.3, that's something that's gonna be over 100 times more acidic than what is your body supposed to be consuming. So if so you should, go down to- We should be to, aiming, for, aiming for seven or? Well, around seven, you know, we're, mm -hmm. water's supposed to be neutral, but because the water toxins that we're being exposed to, you know, the water itself has become so toxic and so polluted. And even if like you take like, you know, you take water that goes down the drain, like if you're in a city system and that water goes back down to a water treatment plant, that water treatment, they basically, the basic steps and, and some vary, you know, from town to town, state to state, but here's the basic synopsis. So the water goes through a basic filtration, which takes out the big chunks. Okay. Most of these chemicals are so tiny in terms of their molecular structure, they're, they just go right through. So, 
they get this filtration, then they dump chem chlorine on it to try and kill whatever bacteria is growing in it. So that's a good thing. So then they aerate it, they try and bubble it to try and get some of the, the, chem the chlorine out of it, okay? There's a, that's a whole nother conversation about what, you know, the issues with chlorine and, and fluorine, okay? Because they're both halogens in, in that group and then they will dis disrupt iodine, which is what we are needed to run our thyroid, okay? So we're starting to see a lot of issues with thyroid related diseases. Okay. And that's a whole other conversation that we can dive into. So but, does, that, does okay. that include fluoride? Is that part of that conversation? Yes. And dental so fluoride, fluoride is just the, so fluorine is the actual element. Fluoride is the ion. An ion is an electrically charged mm -hmm. chemical or, or excuse me, element. Okay. So that's a whole other conversation <laughs> that we could dive into. So don't get me started on that because we'll never end this show. But so anyway, so then they, then they throw chlorine on it. They try and bubble it to aerate it to get some of the chlorine out. And then the only federally, federally regulated water that's in the country right now is the water that comes out of your tap. And it's supposed to have a pH neutral, but they don't talk about any, first of all, they don't talk about the oxidation of, of that water. But so it's supposed to be neutral. So the water now is extremely acidic at this point. So they have to get and raise the pH to meet federal standards. So they usually add things like, for example, sodium hydroxide, because the, the OH makes it a base, okay? So they'll be adding sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is like the, is what we use in Drano, <laughs> okay? So you're putting that into water and then piping that back into the homes. So the water that's coming out of your tap has so many chemicals in it that are, it's ridiculous. So you're seeing a lot of issues from that. So that's the only federally regulated water. All the water bottled or bottled water is not regulated in any way, shape or form. They can put anything in there that they want and they do. And so when you start to see things like, for example, distilled water, you think, okay, that's good. That's great because I've taken all of the toxins out. Okay, thumbs up, great, but... <laughs> That water now is what I call dead water because you do need to have minerals in your water. You're supposed to have minerals. You're supposed to have calcium and magnesium, and, you know, things like that. So when you take all those minerals out, the water becomes very acidic and it becomes very oxidizing to the system. So your body has to alkalize that to bring it to a neutral pH because our bloodstream is a pH of 7.35 to 7.4. It's that precise. So your body will alkalize that water or whatever it is you're drinking, especially things like soda, any carbonated beverage that has CO2 in it becomes carbonic acid. And it's very, very acidic. So it's literally leaching. It's causing your body to have to regulate that in terms of the pH because your body has so many chemical reactions that are regulated that, are, that have to be adjusted to the correct pH. So your body does that. And it does it by taking like, for example, the calcium out of your bones or the magnesium out of your muscles, you know, but it will alkalize that. So, you know, if we're stressing our system out phenomenally by like drinking soda or drinking very acidic water, most of the waters, and that's one of the things that the kids just were horrified at when they started testing the different waters that they're drinking. And they're like, okay, so what do I drink? And I just looked at them like, I, you know, unless you come to my house, which I've got, you know, you know, again, I've been studying water for about 25 years. And when you start to look at, at how acid or acidic it is and how oxidizing it is to the body, it's, it's, it's just uh, anyway. Right. All right. So, so we've reached the point in the podcast where people are either going to want to give up, you know, hitchhike, <laughs> hitchhike to NASA and hitchhike to some other planet. Are there solutions? Well, <clears throat> this I, I really love what you brought up about how people could be overwhelmed and feel like they can, they'll never be good enough and they'll never be able to do enough <clears throat> to create a healthy child. And so they might just want to throw up their hands. And I have to say, I think that that's something that, that most we do a lot of, right? We, we get assailed by all kinds of uh, talk about, you know, fat is good, fat is bad, sugar is good, sugar is bad. All right? And we just, we just throw up our hands and say, I'm, I'm just going to eat what I want, you know, everything in moderation. I mean, that really, that's, I mean, I think that that's, that is actually how most people, or at least a lot of people, are dealing with things nowadays. I would like to suggest that there are small steps that people can take. And this idea that it's more expensive, I think people have done research about this, and a whole plant food diet is not more expensive. You save so much money not, eat, not buying 
processed food and, and meat and dairy, which is much more expensive, especially the meat, um, that you can afford legumes. And people's traditional diets are so much healthier. So really, we have to get back to a way of eating that is more sort of in tune with uh, our bodies as humans. And that is to be eating a whole plant food diet. And it is not more expensive. So you'd be saving money not eating meat. And you'd be doing your body a, f a favor. You'd be creating healthy, your, a healthier family, healthier environment. It's good for the animals. You know, I'm an ethical vegan also. So of course, this is good. And when you think about the outbreaks of this virus in the meatpacking plants and, and how, how really revolting the situation is for people in meatpacking plants and meat processing plants and slaughterhouses for those people. These are some of the most dangerous jobs on the planet and they have very low pay. And it's always sort of the most, um, um, the most dangerous work for people. And, and now we see with the virus that this is also a place where there are these outbreaks of, the, of uh, coronavirus. So you know, for all these reasons, it would be much better to try to eat less meat and more plants. So you could just do it that way. You could just say, I'm going to be an 80-20, right? I'm going to try to mostly eat plants and that'd be great. And can, is there anything that you can do with your personal care products? Um, is there anything you can do to, to stop using cellophane and, and, and um, saran wrap and stop, you know, pat, wrapping everything in plastic? You know, possibly, yes, there are some alternatives. So We'll just advise people, we'll just teach people, we'll just help people to move just a little bit further toward reducing. I mean, we didn't know about this. I didn't know about this when I was an obstetrician. I didn't know about all these endocrine disrupting chemicals having an effect on, on people's pregnancies and on their fetuses. I didn't know that maternal obesity would cause so many problems in the, that would knock IQ points off a baby. I did not know that. And now what's, I know. So. Wait, what's, what's that study? Yeah, yeah. Well, you can look up maternal obesity in the fetal brain. So um, there have been a lot of studies that look at, you know, ob obesity is not just sort of being roly poly, right? It's, I mean, you, it, fat cells are, are not, I remember seeing when so in medical school, they'd roll out sort of 20 pounds of fat and it just looked like this kind of a blob. And you just think, okay, fat is just this inert thing. You know, it's just kind of a squishy thing, but that's not true. It's a very metabolically active, these are very metabolically active cells and they are filled with these inflammatory molecules, inflammatory cytokines. So if you happen to be uh, developing as an embryo or a fetus inside of a mom who has a lot of these, of these, of these, of this adipose tissue. And in addition, she's gaining an excessive amount of weight because she's eating a lot of meat and high fat foods and high saturated fat foods. It is going to be affecting, again, this is like these endocrine disrupting chemicals, these cytokines are going to be affecting the embryo in the fetus and knocking IQ points off. Mm. So you can think as we get heavier and heavier and heavier, our population is, I mean, I don't, can I just say it? I mean, it's getting dumber and dumber. It's very uh -huh. sad. It's a very, very sad thing. And then I think the effects of the endocrine disrupting chemicals on top of that, you know, I don't know if it's synergistic. I don't know if it's, if it's, um, if it's in a just, if it's additive or if it's more than that, but these are also knocking IQ points off. So now you have people who are less intelligent and are more susceptible to having an ADD and ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. So not a good thing. We need to get back on track. And, and it's just the beauty of this. If you can eat whole plant foods or eat mainly whole plant foods, you will, you will not be obese. You will just not be obese and you will not be contributing to this problem. You'll have healthier, and happier and smarter children. Mm -hmm. So I got to ask you a question that I'm, I'm imagining that you get all the time, which is, so a woman gets pregnant, maybe she was eating well, and all of a sudden she wants ice cream and pickles. You know, with us, it was um, Canada dry and, and uh, saltines. Like, you know, there's almost like this, this sense that the cravings of pregnancy uh, are, are proof that like you should just eat whatever you want. You have sort of this license to eat just the weirdest stuff, the weirdest combinations. Do you have an understanding of cravings that makes sense uh, in a different way? Huh. That's a very interesting question. I love your questions, Howard. Uh, they're very thoughtful. And, uh, and I do understand, I, I understand some things about cravings and that is that we have this um, very innate desire for high, high, 
high fat and high sugar foods, foods that are going to give us a lot of energy. I don't know whether in pregnancy that gets deranged a little bit because, you know, people might be looking for uh, slightly different things like these salty foods and, uh, and uh, pickled things. I, I have known about that. Um, but when you eat the standard American diet, uh, you, you're sort of playing into that and you are eating these hyper palatable foods that are sort of addictive. They give you that dopamine rush and it just is this self-perpetuating kind of a thing. The more you eat, the more you want, the less you feel, you know, you just have to eat more and more to get that same high. Uh, so when you change your taste buds, when you eat a more, uh, more, a less refined diet, a more a food that's in its more natural state uh, with a more normal amount of sweetness and, sa and, uh, and saltiness and fat that's appropriate for, our, for us as humans, I think we stop um, desiring some of these as much. So I don't crave mm -hmm. ice cream. I think if, if you, of course, I'm not pregnant, um, but if you, if you had a vegan child, do you have a vegan child, by the way? Are you raising a vegan child? Well, they're 24 and 20, so they, they, you, do, they do what they want at this point. No, but when, did you raise them as plant-based? Um, ish. Oh, okay. <laughs> not, so they not probably- from, not, from, not from birth. I, okay. I, <laughs> well, it'll be interesting to see, I mean, whether, whether children who are raised plant-based, whether they have those same cravings. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think a vegan kid is going to be walking by a pepperoni pizza and saying, oh, I want some of that. I just, mm, I don't think yeah. so. Uh, so maybe, uh, preg so I have not heard from my pregnant patients who were vegan that they were having any unusual cravings for food that was not plant-based. Mm. So you're saying that this is not necessarily body wisdom, but it could just be a, a haywiring of, of, ex of existing toxic patterns. Well said. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Jean, you mentioned earlier that, you, that whatever, when the woman gets pregnant, the sort of the toxins are locked in. Right. So what, what did you mean by that? And like, we, there's nothing you can do once you get pregnant to detoxify or like, well, I'm going to let Deborah talk about that one because yeah. she is more the queen of that. So. Okay. Thank you, Jean. So this is interesting. Of course, you were mentioning before that there were two kinds of toxins. There are toxins that are fat soluble and toxins that are water soluble. We know that within just a few days, and they've done studies with children, for example, that are eating inorganic produce, and then they start eating organic produce. And let me another shout out to the Environmental Working Group because they have this wonderful Dirty Dozen list and the Clean 15. Every year, they look at all the produce in this country and they determine which ones have the most pesticide and herbicide and fungicide residue and which ones have the least. So it's the Clean 15 are the ones that if you have to buy inorganic, you, should, you can. And the Dirty Dozen where you really should only eat organic. So these, these pesticides and herbicides are usually, a lot of them are water soluble. And so you can notice a difference when you look at their urine, that their pesticide level goes down. Some of them are persistent organic uh, pollutants. There are persistent organic pollutants, uh, things like dioxins, things that are in fish particularly, uh, uh, PCBs and PBBs. These things stick around in the fat for a long time. Mercury, I had mercury poisoning twice. And mercury has a half-life of 90 to 100 days. So mm. when, I, when I was determined to um, have mercury poisoning, high levels of mercury in my blood because I was eating too much fish as I was moving along the spectrum from an omnivore to, a, you know, to an herbivore, I uh, stopped at fish for a while and was eating too much. My level was 14 and it took me three months to get it down to seven. How, how did you get diagnosed? How, how did you know to get checked? For it was interesting. I always learn so much from my patients. I really say I had this incredible relationship with my patients and I learned a lot from them. So I had a patient who came to me after a miscarriage and she told me that she had had mercury poisoning and that it was the mercury poisoning that was associated with the miscarriage, caused the miscarriage. Uh, and I learned a lot, not only from her, but also from the doctor that diagnosed her in San Francisco who wrote a book about mercury and, and fish. And she told me about her symptoms and I started thinking about my own symptoms. I had headaches, I had back pain that was sort of chronic and I had a decrease in memory. Mercury is a neurotoxin. And you know, as an, as an OBGYN, there's a lot of stuff that we just talk about constantly. I was talking about hormone replacement therapy with people constantly, talking about birth control with people constantly. And I would always be able to remember the names of drugs that I'd be giving people all the time. And all of a sudden, I noticed that I was not able to recall some of these very common drugs that I was offering people for hormone replacement therapy at the time. 
Uh, so I checked my mercury level because I was eating fish quite a bit. Uh, you know, I have mm -hmm. to say ACOG, American College of OBGYN, still recommends three servings of fatty fish for women um, a week, which is, I just think, really not justifiable right now. Maybe it was 70 years ago before we started polluting our oceans as much, but be mm -hmm. that as may, as, as it may, um, I checked my mercury level and it was 14. And what I learned was that when women are pregnant and they have a certain level of mercury and, they're, and they become pregnant, that's the level that, that the baby, that the fetus will see for its entire pregnancy until the fetus can produce the, the meconium in the stool that, to get rid of it. Um, so even though the maternal level will go down, the, the, the level that the, that the fetus sees stays the same, according to what I've, what I've learned. So now that may not be true about water soluble, water soluble toxins, but it's certainly true about a lot of fat soluble toxins. And this is also happening and when women are losing weight because a lot of toxins that are fat soluble are gonna be stored in your own fat and they're gonna be released when you lose weight and those fat cells are shrink in size. And so this is not the time it's not the time then to get pregnant just when you're losing a lot of weight. It's important to lose, to lose the weight ahead of time and to clear out the toxins from your body as much as possible and to get as healthy as possible and then to conceive. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So um, you guys have a program, right? So, yeah. uh, so let's, 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 let's end by talking about that. Just, you know, if, if, if there are, you know, your target market is listening that they can um, maybe take advantage of it, but also just for anyone to know that even if they don't, you know, work with you, that there are steps that are going to that are going to be helpful because it's you know again with pregnancy it can it can feel sort of like all or nothing like I have to do absolutely everything, you know there's this this um, issue of sort of purity, right. like we don't you know I don't want to have any of that stuff but the reality is we we live in a complex world and taking steps even small steps can can make a big difference it's sort of like you know like our entire life is logarithmic to a certain extent like little changes that don't seem like a big jumps to us can be significant so absolutely so talk absolutely. about talk about how you lead people through what you guide them with what what you provide um, just to give people sort of hope that there is there is hope absolutely jean do you want to talk about the program a little I do, because Deborah and I, we built it. It took us nine months to, to build, and we, the water broke. We were fully dilated, and we gave birth um, back in uh, June, you know, beginning of June. So we, we, you know, have just launched this program because we really wanted, we tried to think about every possible question that, uh, you know, coming into this, you know, uh, what do we need to know? What do we need to change? How do we change it? And I actually had someone who test drove the program as we were building it and she kind of beta tested for us. And literally she did everything, you know, as we went through the program, she did it all. And she had cleaned out her system before. And, you know, from the time she had shields down, she it took six weeks to get her pregnant. So, and she's due in August actually. So I'm excited for her. She's had an uncomplicated preg pregnancy her health has been exquisite throughout the entire pregnancy. So, and I'm looking forward to seeing her birth and how, you know, with, without complications, I, I anticipate that. So, but we offer, you know, I put everything that I could in terms of education. We have a learning management system. So we have two programs that we've created. One is kind of a self-paced, you work through it yourself and, you know, you buy the program and you work through it on your own. Then we have what we call the signature coaching program so that not only, you know, so it's done on a monthly basis. So you can cancel your subscription at any point, but what we want to do is help you to guide you through, first of all, from the food, it's a four step process from replace, inform, reform, and then transform. So you're going through and learning how to transform that. But then we, Deborah and I then focused on what to do before you want to conceive. So here's the steps before what you need to do to get your body pregnant ready, because they don't call it labor or nothing, okay? Mm -hmm. Just saying, okay? It's probably one of the most intense physical experiences you're gonna be going through as a woman. First of all, just carrying this you know, additional amount of weight around your midsection, which throws off your balance. I mean, you get the, what I call the pregnant waddle, you know, as you just before birth. And then the amount of 
stamina and duration that you're going to need to have to be able to give birth is phenomenal. And so we've created a coaching program. So we meet once a week and we kind of educate and help coach you guide, answer your questions. But we also have a, a private group that people that are in the program are in and we answer your questions. We post information daily about different things that we found, you know, recipes, because it's not just about learning about the toxins or, you know, it's learning how to cook this way. It's learning how to shop this way. It's learning how to, to batch cook so that you can time manage, you know, your, your lifestyle. Because once you give birth, <laughs> yeah, life is going to change as you know it. Um, so, you know, how to, how to have time management, how to be able to do that. And we're actually in the process because we've created and launched the pregnancy advantage and we're now, Deborah and I are working on the baby advantage. So the pregnancy advantage will take you through from getting your body pregnant ready. So before to the end of, we consider that conception. So yay, we, we did our job. We got you through, we got you pregnant, and especially for women who are having trouble conceiving before they go down the in vitro fertilization, what I call rabbit hole, you know, that is extremely expensive and usually not covered by insurance. So if we can help you to change so that you can be, be fertile, so that you can have a place where you can launch a baby, you know, and create the best possible mm. nurturing environment for your child. So we've created that. So then we're working on now the baby advantage, which will pick up at conception and then take you through your pregnancy. And then for the first year of not just your baby, it's not, the focus is not so much on the baby, but the focus is on you as a woman, mm. okay? And the changes that your body undergoes as you go through pregnancy. And then afterwards, especially like, you know, the, the depression afterwards, you know, I think of almost like at, after Christmas, like the day after Christmas, like you're just like, oh, you know, this kind of like lethargy. And it's kind of similar to that, what women are going through. But that's also just a hormonal shifts and changes that your body's going through. And, you know, so we want to help guide the woman through these changes that your body undergoes. So we have two basic programs. And so we're very excited about that. And then once we finish with the baby advantage, Deborah and I are going to work on the menopause advantage. So we go from one end to the other. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> there was one last piece. There was one last piece I wanted to just add because we were talking about food and sleep and exercise and, and uh, living more lightly on the earth and using less, less toxins and being careful about all of that. But in addition, optimizing nutrition for pregnancy. So that means uh, being very careful about certain nutrients of concern. And so you can't, you, you do have to think about taking some extra, for example, the fo you know, folic acid and making sure your iodine levels are normal and the DHA and EPA and uh, making sure you're getting enough protein in the second and third trimester and um, calcium and choline and, um, and, uh, and iron. So there, there are definitely these nutrients of concern um, and we don't let you down there. We're definitely keeping up to date and making sure that you have um, a very well supplemented diet, uh, vegan diet, plant-based diet. Gotcha. So the last thing I want to ask about is, so as, as you mentioned at the beginning, Deborah, that there are societal inequities right, that not everyone has access to clean water, to clean air, uh, not everyone can afford broccoli on a regular, you know, um, are there ways, and so, you know, so one of, one of the, like there's a voice in our head that wants us not to get healthy, right? There's like some sort of saboteur voice that's like explaining to us, like, just keep doing what you're doing, it's fine, it's easy, it's delicious, who cares? That voice can sometimes grab onto and misappropriate a voice of genuine concern for others. What are, so what are the ways in which a woman doing this for herself is actually contributing to a more just world for other women? Is, is it zero sum? If I take out the toxins and get better, is, you know, is that just I'm raising myself up above the masses? Or is, is there some, something of a movement that could happen here? Oh, I definitely think so. I think that's brilliant. It's absolutely true. I think women really set the health tone, not only for their families, but for their communities. So if they can create healthier children, if you can do something now that will sort of ensure that your child doesn't develop diabetes or endometriosis or fibroids along the way, I mean, these are all, uh, even heart disease, 
because heart disease really starts in the womb. Um, and if you know how to feed your family, if you know how to create food that you can bring to parties and show others, if you, can, if you really learn to, to, to thrive on this kind of a diet, you make it work for you financially and you make it work for you uh, in terms of time, if you can figure all that out, um, I think anything is possible. You could, you could start you could start having, I mean, people can start having, um, you know, community potlucks, not now during the, <laughs> during the pandemic, but that is something that is happening. You know, we have the plant pure pods, right, right now. Um, so there are communities of people that are getting together and trying to create um, he health on a larger scale for people. And you can't wait for the government to do this for you. But if we don't want the meat, if we don't buy the meat, it will go away. I do believe that's true. Not I, I know there are people who say, it doesn't matter what I do. Even, even my wife says that, you know, the food's already there. The meat's already cut up and it's already sitting on the shelf. It's not going to change, but that's not true. I don't believe that's true. Howard, do you agree? If we don't buy it, it the, the, if the demand is not there, the supply will go down and we will have alternatives. We already see that, right? With meat, with uh, the meat and dairy alternatives. Right. I think there, there are tipping points. I don't know the, I don't know the, the mathematical modeling of it. No, neither do I, uh, but it's, but I'm looking, you know, I think there's two, there's two things here. One is it's just moving in certain directions and especially like women, like my experience of women getting pregnant is that they have to have community around that. So, you know, they got a really strong need to weave connection to like in ways that like that, that men can kind of go off and be very individualistic about lots of things and I got mine. Whereas for, for women in, in pregnancy and childbirth, I think it's just much more of a communal sensibility, like an understanding that we're, we're kind of in this together. And there's no, there's no, you know, that we're all downstream and we're, we're in one boat and if there's a hole. Um, and just this, you know, this idea that, you know, women have, have been devoiced in our society and to be able to say you know that if, if women pregnant women mothers grandmothers um take their roles reclaim their voice to say like this we are the ones who care for the welfare of all like that's our that's our i don't you know i don't want to go into like you know our genetic thing or our cultural thing but i think there is a way in which mothering the the mothering um instinct whether it's from a woman or a man is a broader nurturance than just me and mine and yes it's perfect and you i used to think that it was all about mothering like mothering um holding the baby at the breast right that kind of mothering and being um and being loving as a mom but now I'm thinking, and what I've been learning from all of this is that really your love for your child starts before you conceive. That's, that's really the beauty of this, um, is that you can create healthier generations if you, if you participate in improving your own health before you even conceive. And in terms of community, there is that vegan, there's a vegan pregnancy Facebook group. And, and I think there are going to be more and more uh, more and more sort of community support groups for people who are eating this way. I just want to jump in because when I was giving, when I was pregnant, I was overseas and I was in Bogota, Colombia. Both my children were born in Colombia. I was teaching at private American schools and my only resource, you know, because it was very expensive to call my mother, you know, on the phone back in the day. And so I couldn't really talk to her. I, could, I didn't have friends or family except, you know, at the school. And so, you know, I really hadn't connected with these people. But what you said, Howard, was so important about that connection. And I felt so isolated and alone. And my only resource that I had was the, there was a series of books called What to Expect While You're Expecting, What to Expect during the first year. And that was my only source. And I, it was a one-way street because I couldn't connect with these people. And I think that's one of the things that we do in our group is we connect other women that are going through the same situation. And so we're providing the support there because you are right. Women connect. 
you know, in terms of with other women, you know, are you seeing this or what, you know, developmental, are you seeing this or how about for breastfeeding or, you know, are you having cracked nipples? Are you having, you know, so all of these things, we connect with each other and we share this information. So I think in having it with someone who can help guide you along, like Deborah is amazing, you know, in that sense, because she sees it, you know, on a day-to-day basis, but I think you're right. I mean, and that's what providing that network of, of connections with women that can help them to understand, okay, how do I deal with my mother-in-law who, who wants to give my kids, you know, whatever, or, mm. you know, just having that support there, even if it's, you know, through Facebook or, you know, whatever, having that support and that network is huge. So I think it's, and I think that's one of the things that Deborah and I are trying to do is provide that community support. Mm-hmm. That's, right. that's something that uh, that Dean Ornish always really stresses, right? That, mm-hmm. that the love and connection is so important for, for, for allowing people to reach their potential in terms of health and, uh, and, and seeing that really blossom. So I think having that connection is very, very important. Right. And especially in our, in our you know, fractionated world, like motherhood can be the loneliest thing ever. Right. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, the demands on the woman... She's out of society, out of the workforce, especially now with a with a pandemic. Um, you know, it's, it's just it's it's just not natural to not be surrounded by a clatch of of people. Take the baby, I need a rest. You know, the village. These are very extraordinary times right now with the pandemic, and that's another reason. I'm, and I think about I have had patients who are trying to get pe- pregnant, and I have patients that are pregnant right now, and I. I, I feel very sad for them because I think they're they're really going to be suffering. And just like with the Project Ice Storm, I think this is Project uh, COVID. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't know what will happen with the next generation that are coming out of this. I think this is not the best of times to be pregnant. I'm sorry to say that because I know people are doing their best and I don't want to add to their burden and their stress by suggesting that it, the timing was off. But I, you can't imagine that it isn't having an effect. So that's it's, it's very sad, but this is the perfect time to prepare for a pregnancy in 2021 or 2022. It is the perfect time. If you're carrying an extra 75 pounds of weight on you, this is the perfect time to learn how to eat differently so that you can get that weight off before you have a child and have a healthier pregnancy and one that's less complicated with preeclampsia and, and uh, diabetes and needing inductions and, and, and having hemorrhages. So it's all, it's all going to be perfect. Um, but in, in terms of support, I, I agree. That's another part that people are really missing with this pandemic, that they're not able to get together except through Zoom. And I'm very grateful that we have that. Can you imagine if, if we didn't? Right. So how do people find you? Where are you online? What do they need to do to find out more and get started? Well, we have a website. Eugene. We have- uh, we, we have a Facebook page, um, The Pregnancy Advantage. And actually, Deborah and I go live usually on Thursdays at 12 o'clock noon Eastern Standard Time, 9 o'clock Pacific. We go live um, once a week and we take your questions. You know, people connect with us ahead of time so that we can get your questions. Like, we like to dive deep. We were very much, we're research based. We like to make sure that we're bringing you the most current research that's out mm-hmm. there that we know to be correct. So, we want to make sure that we're answering your questions correctly. So, so that's, that's, your- that's on Facebook? That's on Facebook, the Pregnancy Advantage mm-hmm. Facebook page. And that's just also, open, open to everyone. That's open to everyone. And okay. then we have pregnancyadvantage.net. So that's where our website is and that's where we, our programs live. So you can find more about that. What All about right. the free giveaway? We, have a, we actually have something that's very interesting to help women get, uh, it's sort of the three things that we feel are most important for helping women get ready for pregnancy. And that's at? Pregnant, it, <laughs> yep pregnantready.net. So if you go to pregnantready.net, you can get the download for free, the top three things that Deborah and I think you should be working on to get your body pregnant ready. So like you said, those small changes, these three changes are going to be huge. If you can follow these three changes, that's going to help you to have a better chance of conceiving, have a better chance of a healthier pregnancy, less complications down the road. So you can go to pregnantready. Dot net and that will get you a free giveaway. So our top three things that we think, and we dive deep into the, to all three of those topics. So Awesome. Thanks. So I want to end with one question for each of you. It's the same question I've been asking of lots of guests, and I'm really enjoying the process of the questions and the answer. Is what's, what's some music 
that you're listening to right now that you really enjoy and that other people probably don't know about? Mm. Mm. I am an ex-hippie right. and I was sort of a deadhead in back in the day. I, brought, I came to the Grateful Dead late as a boyfriend. Uh, it was 1977. I really didn't know about them before that. So I missed sort of the, the dark star moments. But there was a song that really brings me back to a, a, a much more peaceful time when I was lying around just um, throwing rainbows on the wall with, with a flashlight through a prism. <laughs> and, it's, um, and I was probably high on something at the time. But it's uh, Crazy Fingers by the Grateful Dead. I really love that song. And it just really just brings brings me some some great memories and peace. All right. Did you follow them around at any point? I did. I was one of those. Uh, I mean, I didn't have the dreadlocks, but um, but I would walk around with trying, you know, I need a miracle <laughs> to get a free uh -huh. ticket. So did you ever go to the Grateful Dead concerts? No, I'm uh, I'm too young. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. I am 60. Oh, well, well, there you go. Uh, I also, yeah, I also I wasn't, I wasn't very precocious musically. So uh. I don't know if the Grateful Day were, were, were um, associated with that, but I, I did love them. And that was the Crazy Fingers is a great song. I wonder if people who weren't deadheads would, would like it. No, no. I'll, I'll, I'll find a, uh, one, of, one of the zillion bootleg recordings and, and put it up. Uh, oh, you just on the, ask your Alexa. Show. Fantastic. On the show. <laughs> cool. Oh, Jean, what about you? I have extremely eclectic tastes in terms of music. And I, because I lived in Central America, Central and South America for 13 years, I'm mm -hmm. very much influenced by a lot of music from, from there. And I loved like the Brazilian, like a lot of the Brazilian singers, like Caetano, Caetano Veloso, Chico Boachi. I mean, I loved Maria Batania. I mean, these are oh, awesome, can, amazing, I can't amazing write them down. people. Can you can you, can you, email, text, you. E text me or email me the names and I'll go, I'll I go will. look them up because this is. But also, but Hombre Hey was another one. They're from Spain. And again, another group that I considered to be, I love the Beatles growing up. And these to me were like the Spain's version of the Beatles. And so they were fun to watch and watch their career evolve and see how they did. But also like people from Colombia, like um, Carlos Vives, who is just incredible in terms of his music. So, you know, but I love, I mean, I'm a rock and roll. I mean, old time, you know, me, and, you know, <laughs> give me some old time rock and roll, you know, and I'll be there dancing like Tom Cruise, you know. Oh, awesome, so. awesome. Does, does, can music help with pregnancy? Oh, I'm going to answer that one because my son was rather, you know, would get up and cry and just cry for hours on end. And so I found some country and Western, like, you know, uh, Willie Wayland and the boys. And I would just put that on. Not that I'm a big country and Western person. I mean, again, it's just my eclectic taste, but I would put on some, some of their softer sides of music and I would get up and I would just start rocking and I would rock you know, stand up rocking my son and that's it. And it's so funny because, and I never told him this, but it, those songs are like embedded in his head because I can't tell you how many nights we spent <laughs> rocking mm. to Willie Whalen and the boys. And without me saying a word, you know, he's like, God, I really like this song, you know? And it was <laughs> one of the songs that I used to play for him, you know, it, when we were rocking together and I would be up there rocking, you know, and, you know, just calming him down. And that was one of the ways he was able to go to sleep. So I r absolutely think that music definitely is, is, you know, calming the inside beast inside of there. And I used it a lot to help my kids in playing, especially like some, some more um, classical music. You know, neither one of my kids are classical fans, but, but I would play some calming music, you know, as I was breastfeeding or, you know, just to have that as the environment, because I think it sets a huge environment. I think even earlier, even in pregnancy, we can use music as um, to help with stress reduction and stress management. Uh, so that's important. And there have been some studies, I'll have to look into it more because I don't know that much about it, but about uh, playing music for the fetus, because they say that, you know, the fetus can actually hear. So mm -hmm. whether certain types of music might actually help the baby's brain develop in a certain way, possibly classical music might have more of an effect um, than even my beloved Grateful Dead. So uh, I'll do a little bit more research about that for uh, next time. 
Cool. Yeah, that that would be amazing if they discovered that like you know Ripple was the uh, the song that gave like you know, ten, ten extra <laughs> IQ points. <laughs> that would be easier than uh, trying to lose a hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. Gene Schumacher and Dr. Deborah Shapiro, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic conversation. I can't wait to share it with people. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. It was wonderful questions. You're very thoughtful. Thank you. All right. We, well, we really appreciate your time and thank you. We can't say enough. Thank you for, for having us on your show. Oh, pleasure. Thanks for reaching out. Talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.